I'd like to welcome everybody to the Western Sydney Health Professional Co-Design Feedback Loop One. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're here to uh, share with you some of the information that we've been provided by health professionals in the uh, Western Sydney region um, about what it's like for them when they're either supporting or they're with someone who's accessing help through the emergency department during a suicidal crisis. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. But before I do that, my name's Tina. So I'm one of the facilitators with Roses in the Ocean. And hi, everyone. I'm Carrie. I'm also one of the facilitators of this process and a facilitator with Roses in the Ocean. OK, so I'll just share my screen with you. And we'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're all located on. So we're located in different parts of New South Wales, um, but in particular, we would like to acknowledge the Darug people um, because the new safe haven that is being set up in Western Sydney will be located on Darug land. So we'd like to pay our respects to Darug elders past and present, as well as the young Darug, pe Darug people who will be the elders of the future. We also like to acknowledge the expertise that people with lived experience bring to this co-design process and um, not just the lived experience participants, but also that many health professionals have lived experience of suicide themselves and also bring great knowledge from their experiences um, supporting people in suicidal crisis and walking alongside them when they seek help. So we've just kickstarted this process in Western Sydney. Um, and the idea is that we're bringing together all of the experts to co-design a new safe haven for the region. Um, so what's happened so far, um, there's been an orientation webinar that um, people were asked to watch and people were provided an information pack. Um, the Ministry of Health statement of requirements for the safe havens were sent. And um, we've had two sets of conversations. So the first set of conversations we had were with people who have lived experience of suicide who are in the Western Sydney area. Um, and we had a workshop with them. And now after that, we had a, a series of smaller conversations with health professionals from Western Sydney, uh, what we call focus group conversations. And so now what we're doing is we're presenting webinars um, to share with a broader audience the information that we have been um, provided by people with lived experience and health professionals in in the Western Sydney area. Um, this webinar will be looking to share with you all the information that we've um, been able to gather from health professionals um, and the idea is that it's not just the people who participated in those fo focus conversations who um, get to contribute ideas to this co-design process. Um, so we encourage health professionals who are watching this to share the link for this webinar and for the survey that can be completed at the end of watching the webinar. Um, we encourage you to share that with as many people as you know. Um, we'd like to get uh, as many diverse perspectives as possible from health professionals in Western Sydney. Um, and it's an opportunity for people who aren't involved in those small conversations to become involved in this co-design process. So I mentioned earlier that we've we've had these smaller focus conversations with um, groups of um, four, two to four health professionals. Um, and the purpose of those focus conversations was to explore what it's like for a health professional when they're either supporting someone or they're involved in treating someone or walking alongside with someone who is going through that process of seeking help through the emergency department during a suicidal crisis. And you can see on this slide here, we've got some of the different perspectives that have already been contributed to the process. So we were able to hear from um, people who are from the ambulance service, from an AOD service, um, from community mental health, older person's mental health, 
uh, there was a mental health social worker who we were able to speak with and also clinicians in inpatient settings. Um, so we've captured a broad range of perspectives already, but like I said, we, we want to capture as many people's perspectives as we can. Um, so we encourage you to uh, share the link for this webinar and to also encourage other health professionals in Western Sydney to provide feedback through the survey that we're putting out. So when we sat down with health professionals, we went through with them a process that mirrors the process that we've used with people who have lived experience. So both health professionals and people who have lived experience of suicide have shared with us what it's like for them at each stage of that process of seeking help through the emergency department during a suicidal crisis. And um, first we asked people with lived experience uh, we took them through what we call touch points. So those particular touch points um, that we focus on are the experience when a person is trying to find out how to access help. So before they arrive at the emergency department, either when they're trying to work out how to access that kind of help or how to get to the emergency department, or it might involve somebody else making the decision that they need help and maybe contacting emergency services. So finding the emergency department is the first touch point. Uh, the next touch point that we look at is the experience of people when somebody arrives at the emergency department and has that initial assessment. After that, we explore people's experiences when a person who is seeking help is waiting because there are many times during that process that a person might be asked to wait. Some people go on to receive treatment. Um, and for those people who go from the emergency department to receiving treatment or for those health professionals that have supported someone or treated someone um, who has gone through that experience, um, we explore those, uh, what it's like for people at that time. And then the last thing that we explore is what it's like when a person who has experienced a suicidal crisis is leaving. So that includes people who leave directly from the emergency department and it also includes people who have received treatment and are leaving after treatment. So both health professionals and lived experience um, participants in the co-design have explored what it's like for them in these touch points. So the key difference is for people with lived experience, they're exploring what it's like at each stage of the process as a person who is either seeking assistance through the emergency department or is there as a carer, maybe a friend or a family member um, who is supporting a person who's going through that experience? And we also we, we also look at um, people who haven't been to the emergency department or would choose not to do that again because of their past experiences. We explore those same touch points with health professionals, but with health professionals, what we're interested in is What's it like to be a person walking in a health professional's shoes when somebody is accessing help through the emergency department during a suicidal crisis? So we've gone through each of these touch points with health professionals and they have been incredibly generous in sharing with us what kinds of feelings they experience at each of those touch points, um, but also the reasons for those feelings. Now this is really useful inf information for the co-design process because feelings often reflect unmet needs. And so what we're interested in is not just whether the current system, how it's meeting the needs of people with lived experience, but also how the current process of helping people through the emergency department in a suicidal crisis, how that fits in with the needs of health professionals. Because when we design this, this safe haven, this um, alternative to going through the process of seeking help through the emergency department, we would like it to be able to meet these needs. And the feelings that, and the experiences of people really tells us a lot about what those needs are. So that's a little bit about the process and um, the way the process has been structured. And what we're going to just share with you now is um, what health professionals told us about what their experience is like at each of these touch points when somebody is seeking help through the emergency department during a suicidal crisis. So I'm 
that's what we're going to have a look at now. I'm going to pass over to Carrie, uh, who's going to um, share with you the information that health professionals were able to provide us. Great. Thanks, Tina. And as Tina's already flagged with you, there are these key touch points. Um, and, and just, I guess, as a qualifier, we know that health professionals very rarely would be able to provide information about every one of those touch points. People fit in different parts of the health system. People are providing different services. People are also in, we, you know, in community-based services where they're not directly working in the hospital, ED and hospital system. Um, and so we just got people to talk about the bits that were relevant to them, that they had some sort of insights and perspectives on. So in terms of this finding, this initial um, people either reaching out to get help uh, through emergency or perhaps someone else calling, um, for example, triple O in response to someone experiencing suicidal crisis. The feelings that health professionals um, reported having at this point was um, they felt daunted, unprepared, um, anxious, um, guarded, confused. There was concern, frustrated. That's a word that you'll see um, coming through quite strongly in, in um, a number of the touch points, unsure. Also um, identifying that they felt um, compassion and empathy for the person that they were um, supporting. And um, in terms of why, um, these are some of the reasons that health professionals reported uh, that were um, the why of these feelings. So a typical scenario for the community team is you take a call and try to de-escalate over the phone. So that idea of um, trying to keep those, um, keep people um, outside of ED and not having to, to go to ED by trying to um, reduce distress over the phone. Commonly health professionals We've heard, we heard this from more than one person, take the risk of transporting patients in their own car rather than waiting for emergency services. There was concern regarding the legal ramifications of the health professionals' act, um, actions um, and how that may impact um, on um, them, both themselves and the patient. Uh, there was uh, someone reported feeling anxious as they don't trust the ED route, route as necessarily the best um, for people in suicidal crisis, recognising the idea that ED, as we're hearing um, both from the health professional perspective and the lived experience perspective, is set up for a physical health crisis and not um, a suicidal crisis for people. Sometimes having to wait with the patient for a considerable amount of time for the ambulance can be a stressful time for people. And then confusion regarding protocols, for example, the involvement of police was something that led to confusion and people being unsure. Thanks, Tina. Um, and we've just wanting to animate some of that, that information with some quotes um, that um, just to really see how, um, how much people's perspectives and insights are really providing like a very valuable con a number of times the clinicians take a bit of a risk to transplant, transport clients by themselves rather than wait for emergency services while waiting something can happen. So we heard that a number of times. Um, someone else just said they felt unprepared. And then here is someone saying anxiety because I don't have trust that the ED route is the best for clients. As I said um, before, they report, have reported that they have had bad experiences in the past. And, and this health professional says that they don't have trust with the health system in relation to um, providing the best support and, and the most appropriate care for people experiencing suicidal crisis. Thanks, Tina. So this is the next touch point as we're calling it. And that's that um, point in which people arrive at the ED and the initial assessment process. So just asking health professionals that have had the experience with this part of the ED process, what they were feeling and why. So um, we heard that they feel that it's an unpleasant experience. They, they themselves feel frightened by it, anxious under um, pressure, that it was a heavy feeling, the weight of responsibility particularly. They feel concerned and again, frustrated. And some of the reasons why um, health professionals told us that there were challenges with ambulance services, um, accessing appropriate care in a timely manner and that all while that was happening, that things are escalating. Uh, people are becoming more distressed. 
Um, there was a challenge in building and rebuilding relationships with people who you've built rapport with in the past and then the system has let them down previously. There was also challenges when families and carers were reporting conflicting levels of severity to the person, to the patient themselves, and not being at it being very difficult for professionals to be able to determine the, the facts of the situation and therefore the level of risk. Um, we, we heard on the other hand that when there is a relationship with a hospital and specialist, that, that, um, that good those good prior relationships enable some ease of access, able to call before going to hospital so they know to expect us is what one of the professionals said and they can let us know when to arrive so they don't they don't have to have those long waiting times then just also people talking about the fact that there's this kind of tension between personal emotions those private feelings and then professional obligations and that's something a kind of theme that started emerging through the conversations thanks tina and here are some quotes a lot is dependent on whether there have been sections so sectioned or scheduled under the Mental Health Act. There's pressure, it's a difficult situation to be in. You go through your emotions and you know you're doing the right thing. It's sad that you have to do this, and that, but there is also satisfaction that they are going to benefit. It's unpleasant. Thanks, Tina. And now the waiting period, which we know can happen a number of times across this process and that it's a really critical period. We hear that from people with lived experience and health professionals. So some of the feelings associated with this point is uncomfortable, frustrated again, there's pressure, uncertainty and being unsure again. Um, also, um, there's conflict, feelings of being sad. We heard um, a health professional in particular just talking about the sadness that they felt um, in, in seeing people um, in emotional pain and distress, but also someone saying more positively that they felt hope at this point. So some of the reasons why that health professionals told us that having to seek alternative transfer routes due to lack of capacity was um, something that was part of this sort of pressure. Uh, patients and families and carers become frustrated with wait times between arrival and triage. This leads to people becoming more and more disengaged, wanting to work out, uh, walk out. This is then increases levels of distress and this can lead to the need um, uh, to schedule people under the Mental Health Act which then in itself creates further distress and what a health professional called a, a vol potentially volatile situations. And so really talking about the cycle of that. Then there was also someone saying that there was internal conflict between wanting to wait and stay with the patient, but knowing there are so many more community members wanting for, waiting for help and not getting it. We heard this from the perspective of a community team person, but also from the ambulance service. So here's an example, ambulance officers really talking about that incredible pressure from their control center, hearing that there are more jobs coming in and that there's a need for a car. So having that um, external pressure, but also then the pressure of um, needing to stay and wait with the patient. And then the ED environment, just being distracted, distracting and not a safe space where um, a health professional can have a supportive counseling conversation with a person in distress. Thanks, Tina. And here are some quotes, um, which just follow up from what I've been uh, saying. So ambulance officers can't leave until someone takes care of them, the patient. It's frustrating because we don't just turn up and leave. We've been there for hours trying to unload a patient. Um, you constantly question your expertise, your clinical judgment. That's something that's come out very strongly already in these, just in having these um, initial focus conversations. The clinicians might think it is unethical to write a mental health schedule just because of speculation that the person may have gone. So that was a, a, a real kind of ethical dilemma that we heard uh, a couple of health professionals talking about just the pressure and the weight of responsibility around that. Thanks, Tina. And then at the point of treatment, so obviously not everyone experiences treatment that is going to ED through a suicidal crisis. Sometimes it could be in an inpatient setting, the PEC unit. So this really captures all of that. Um, health professionals, some of the feelings um, and emotions associated with this part um, of the process is they felt anger, frustrated again, mixed emotions. Um, they felt passionate, so still passionate about being able to provide the best care for people. And someone talked about it's um, actually feeling hopeless. And some of the reasons why that we heard from health professionals were that there were um, quite, um, quite varied sort of um, levels of quality of care across the health system in the local health district that 
allied health staff we've heard we heard um felt that they didn't know where they fit into a multidisciplinary team if they had even had a voice in that team and so they um would sometimes hold their voices because doctors determine things and that um we also heard that that um really that emphasis on how important it is to see a person experiencing suicidal crisis from a holistic perspective and not just a medical model and how there's that tension inherent there in a, in a very biomedical system about how you're able to do that. And then feeling hopeless, as I said before, this person was saying, feeling hopeless, seeing patients get stuck in a vicious cycle, as they call it, that they can't get out of. Um, and then also concern that the proper assessment just isn't happening because of this, so many other organisational constraints, time pressures and those sort of things, um, particularly within a ward. And then also um, the, the, um, the idea that the links between someone's substance use and their suicidality is not able to be properly explored. Thanks, Tina. And then just some quotes here. So should be more advocacy done for the patient. So there was a health professional saying that they felt that that um, was something that was very limited, the capacity to do that. Um, then a question here, has there been enough time invested in exploring their circumstances? It's recognising that it takes courage to present to hospital, to present to ED and needing to really honour that in a person. Um, and then someone saying one that stands out for me is when someone comes in, the first thing you hear is BPD. So in other words, the person's diagnosis that's often very stigmatised. And the next thing is, by the way, they've come in with self-harm. And so for that health professional, what they're communicating there is that there's a prejudgment. Oh, oh, we've got a, we've got the frequent flyer, and and how um, difficult it is for them to hear that. Thanks, Tina. And then leaving. So, some of the um, emotions and feelings that um, health professionals told us they experienced at, at this point of the process when someone has sought help or has been, um, you know, uh, taken to ED by someone, they may have been given treatment, they may not have, they may have, have left on their own accord. Um, and that is frustrated, worried, anxious, and disappointed. And some of the reasons for that is that we were told by health professionals that sometimes people are not involved or informed in their own discharge planning, and they leave without a meaningful connection to support services. That people's information, contact details, and the handover to the community care team is not always consistent, and that can lead to people um, as someone said, falling through the cracks. Uh, also just health professionals saying they feel as though they could have done more. We really heard very clearly how um, much health professionals in the local region want to be able to provide the very best care, compassionate um, care for people in experiencing suicide across the but, but feeling that they are very constrained within the system to be able to always do that. Um, also just um, the idea that people know that there's no guarantee that people will receive the support that's been initiated or commit to it, that we can't control that kind of outcome, including people following up and staying with those ongoing supports. After hours, just being simply a, another of those practical challenges. And then um, a health professional saying that just you, you question whether what they have done and what the health system is doing is, is right for people. Thanks, Tina. And just some quotes here, disappointed for them. They've done the right thing in putting their hand up for help and they've fallen through the cracks. Someone else said people are discharged with no communication or transfer of care. And this can lead to frustration for health professionals. And also people who present all the time, you question, are we doing enough for these people? And, and this health professional um, shared with us their disappointment that, that they couldn't have done more. Thanks, Tina. Okay, thanks, Carrie. <clears throat> so um, as you can see, uh, we've been lucky to have um, health professionals talk to us that have been able to really give us um, an understanding of what it is like for them when um, they're either involved in the treatment or support or walking alongside a person who's accessing the emergency department during a suicidal crisis. Um, we have covered a lot of ground but you can also see that we've got a lot of a long way to go still with the, the co-design process and that's going to involve asking health professionals 
um, about a number of things, but we've got particular questions that we'd like to explore. So what do health professionals need to feel comfortable supporting people to access a, a safe haven and confident in promoting it to the local community? So the success of the safe haven will very much um, involve health professionals who are supportive of people accessing the safe haven um, and also um, in order to recommend it to other health professionals and to people who might be experiencing crisis, um, obviously there are things that health professionals need to feel confident about doing that. Um, so we'll be exploring that with health professionals in the next session. Um, we're also interested in um, what does the ideal safe haven look like in Western Sydney? Um, we find that different parts of New South Wales have uh, sometimes quite different ideas about um, about how a safe haven will work. And these reflect the very diverse needs that you find in um, communities in different parts of New South Wales. So after we've looked at what a safe haven in Western Sydney might look like, um, we'll then explore what are the areas of alignment and divergence between people with lived experience and health professionals locally. So we're having these conversations with people with lived experience of suicide as well. And what we'll do is we'll bring that information together and we'll be able to work out where do they match up, um, but also where might they be different because where, where people have different ideas, what we need to do is have further conversations and to explore uh, what might work best in Western Sydney. Um, we'll also look at uh, how those, uh, I guess, ideas about safe haven match up with what the Ministry of Health requires um, in terms of the way that the safe haven is set up and run. Um, so some key things that we'll be looking at in terms of gathering information and ideas from health professionals are uh, what, what should the, the guest experience be like in the safe haven? Um, and we'll have a look at connections. So specifically, how will people connect to the safe haven? Um, so how are they going to find out about it and, and get there? Um, but also connections out of the safe haven. So who will the safe haven connect guests to when they leave? Um, we'll have a look at the staffing for the safe haven and ideas around that workforce as well as ideas that health professionals have about the physical environment. So what the safe haven will look like, what will be provided for people when they're in the, in the safe haven, um, those physical characteristics of the space. Um, so we'll ha also have a look at access issues, um, you know, how, how, what will be required in order to access the safe space, how, what's gonna happen when a person accesses the safe space, what processes, what information might be um, gathered, those sorts of um, access uh, issues. And then we'll also have a look at governance. And so how will the safe space be, be managed? Um, how will it fit into the existing governance of New South Wales Health? So in terms of where to from here, um, so we have already recorded uh, just a an hour earlier, uh, a webinar sharing with people who have lived experience of suicidal crisis in the Western Sydney area, sharing with them uh, what people with lived experience have told us during their co-design sessions. Um, so that webinar and this webinar that we've just presented will be available for people to watch. Um, and we'll be asking and inviting people to fill in a survey. There's a separate survey for people with lived experience of suicide and a, a survey for people who are health professionals in the Western Sydney region. Um, we'll gather all of that information from the survey and it'll be presented back to um, people who are health professionals um, in their next session, session two. Um, so that they can be aware of what people are contributing to the process. And then after the conversations we have with health professionals um, in, in, in that second session, we'll do another webinar like you've just watched um, and invite people to contribute again to the process through a survey. After that, we actually bring everybody together. So people with lived experience of suicide and health professionals in the Western Sydney region will all come together for a joint stakeholders session or a combined session. Um, and that's when we'll explore um, those, those areas of 
divergence, so where there might be some, some different ideas between health professionals and people with lived experience. And we'll also explore some scenarios where we'll get to see how the ideas about the um, safe haven, how they might work in real life. Um, so, and after, after that session, there will be another webinar so that um, people who weren't involved in the session can become involved in the process again. Thanks, Tina. Um, so we know that we've provided you with quite a bit of information and we'd encourage you because this is a recorded webinar to go back and take your time with it if, if that's what you need to do. We'd also encourage you to look at the lived experience webinar that, as Tina said, we, we have just uh, recorded earlier today. That is actually an even longer one because we, we had um, a whole day workshop with those people. I think it starts to be very interesting to people to see those areas of alignment, there's a lot of common themes coming out um, and to see where people with lived experience and health professionals are talking about some of the um, unmet needs and um, some of the feelings are, are, are quite similar as well. So I think that's interesting for people to see that starting to emerge locally. Um, as Tina had said, this survey, what we really want people to do um, is to spread the word about this, this survey, send the link to, to your formal networks, but also we know what's so important in your local area is you have those informal networks that are so important that people that are providing, say, more community-based support that um, really are probably addressing some of those, um, those broader contributing factors to, to, to someone's um, experience of suicidal crisis. We know that. Um, many people that die by suicide um, haven't been in contact with the mental health service in the previous 12 months. We, we are really part of the reason why they're developing these safe houses is in recognition that um, suicidal crisis is, is not necessarily reducible to the idea of a diagnosable mental health condition. So it's really important that you get all tap into all of your networks and spread the word and um, spread this far and wide so we can get that broader input those missing voices that we know are so important to meaningful co-design processes. Um, I'll just hand it over to anyone watching if there's any questions that you want to ask live. Of course, you're more than welcome to ask um, questions via email to Roses in the Ocean at any point during this process. We certainly want to hear from you if you've got any questions for us as facilitators or for Roses in the Ocean. Um, just giving people a moment, otherwise, um, just want to say again, thank you to the health professionals that participated in the focus conversations. They were very, very rich discussions and the insights um, and perspectives really, um, pe people were very generous in sharing those insights that were quite deeply personal at times and, and it really does make for a better co-design process. So thank you very much. Um, and if there are no questions, um, we'll see you all soon and thanks very much for um, listening today. Yeah, thank you. All right.